Good morning, Redwall Survivor. Foxpen here, bringing you another Mosh Flower Odyssey for the Beast in the Crater Top 30 Character Application Reading and Reveal. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Beast with the Gift of Gab, and we have three applications here. Two voles and a bat. So, um, predominantly a, uh, a quote-unquote good beast dominated category. Um, I know bats are sometimes considered very neutral, but in the one book I remembered, bats talking <laughs> they seem to be on the on the good beast side yeah uh, and in that book um is that loam hedge i don't remember i don't actually remember which book it was but uh it doesn't matter so uh we're gonna start with a sly speakeasy he's a 24 year old vole all right it was a full moon tonight but also very cloudy keeping the road dark very dark sly liked it dark to an extent it's hard to be followed in the dark, but unfortunately, also difficult to see Sly's favorite sight, the looks on other beasts' faces. Tonight, however, that was a good thing. That meant other beasts wouldn't see his face, particularly the two otters ahead. All right, Sly, just slip on by. Hey, you, where are you creeping off to? I'll be spotted immediately, that's fine as well. The vole put on his best smile and strode straight towards the brutes. Nowhere in particular, kind sirs, any suggestions? The slightly bigger brute, the one who shouted, grunted, Don't get smart. I need an answer. Don't worry, I'll keep it dumb. I'm simply on my nightly stroll, stretching the old legs a bit. You know how it is. The smaller otter shook his head. I haven't seen you around here. Well, I didn't say I strolled here specifically on a nightly basis, Sly said, waving his paws in a circle around himself. that would get boring quick. Need to change the scenery, you know. Besides, what's so wrong with my being here? Bigger brute growled, There's been a troublemaker in the taverns lately. Stealing, drinking too much, and, recently, getting into fights. Oh, my! Sly gasped. I hope you nabbed that rascally, and I should say. Nobody likes a troublemaker, least of all the drunks. They've already got so much to worry about, they don't need that sort of thing. Bigger Brute growled again. What's interesting to me is those drunks are saying it's a vole, and here you are. Oh, my, again! Sly gasped. Again. How presumptuous of you! I never explored this sort of profile, and least of all from you, respectful gentle beast. I'm offended. I'm appalled. I'm leaving. Right this very moment. Sly turned to run, but smaller otter snatched him up before he got too far. Sly hung his head, and he was turned to face the brutes. I'm sorry I ran. I'm not, Bigger Brute replied. Just proves you're guilty. See, that's not true at all, Sly said. I'm not guilty, just frightened. You frightened me. Because you're guilty said Bigger Brute. No, because I look guilty, sir, Sly said. Nothing is scarier than looking guilty. Prove to me you're not. Bigger Brute motioned for Smaller Otter to put the vole down. Smaller Otter obliged. Sly rubbed the back of his neck and took a deep breath before continuing. You see, I didn't want to admit that. The truth is, the troublemaker's my brother, Laddie. Well, his real name is Leonard, but we know he'd never have fun with a stuffy name like that, so we changed it. Anyway, I've been telling Laddie to lay off the drinking, but he won't listen. There's a fire in his belly that he just can't quench, no matter how much he drinks, so he's been dragging me from tavern to tavern for days now. It's been so long, I've almost forgotten to how to speak to sober beasts. So tonight, just after a few runs, I knew I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed Laddie by the shoulders, looked him in the face, and I told him, says, says Laddie, it's done. I can't drink with you anymore. You become a monster. To which he replied, who are you? I'm confused, Smaller Otter interrupted. As was I, Sly cried, his voice cracking. Who am I? He couldn't recognize me, my own brother. So I screamed, I don't know anymore, and I punch him in the nose. But I don't know what happened after that. I was all confused blur, shattering glass and shrieking mouse-wise. But the next thing I know, I'm out on the street where moments later, oh, do you fellas, now here we are. The Otter stood in silence, presumably deep in thought. Maybe. Sly couldn't be sure. I believe my soul-bearing confession should suffice, yes? He asked. They never said anything about two voles, Bigger Brute growled. We're voles, sir. We're small. Any beast can confuse us for one. Bigger Brute only frowned. I'm not convinced. That's fine. It wasn't a very convincing story, Sly agreed. But what's important is that you didn't notice me creeping towards these very dense bushes. Before the brutes could react, Sly gave them a smarmy little salute, briefly savoring their shared stupid look, and dashed into the underbrush. So there you have Sly Speakeasy. Um, I'm not sure if he's supposed to quick as talk, uh, talk as quickly as I made him, but I just see this little dude running his mouth a mile a minute. I don't know why. He's got so much to say without actually saying anything. <laughs> um, so he, he, you know, he's, I'm not sure if his brother is metaphorical for him or just part of this made up story. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that the, the brother is just, it's him that he's talking about. Um... 
so he's got a bit of a drinking problem. He likes to fight. He he may not be as clever as he thinks he is. But he's he's managed to give these two otter guards the slip. So he's he's still pretty clever. He's at least cunning. Um, I don't know. I, ca- I kind of thought the ending was a little too easy. He got away just like, aha, well, what's important is while I was distracting you with my inane stories, you didn't see me slowly edging my way away. I suppose he talks with his hands. I do that, and it can be distracting for people. You should see me do these recordings. It's like a freaking kung fu movie. Um, yeah, the de- he definitely he, he talks a lot. Um, I don't think he... I don't know. I don't think he, like, has a gift for Gab. I know he certainly likes to run his mouth. Um, he, like I said, he talks a lot. So, um... Also, this line, we're voles, or we're small, any beast could confuse us for one. Playing off of the uh, the species trope that voles are teeny tiny and very often overlooked. So, yeah, it, it, it is feasible that anyone could confuse them for one. So, like, it was um, a straightforward app. Um, tells tells you a little bit about Sly, you know, um, what, what exactly he's doing in front of those two otters. At least we know he got drunk and he got into a fight and there were screaming mousewives. And um, here he is. He, he was on the street moments later where he runs into these fellows. Um, so yeah, he's a vole. He's small. He leans on that character, tro- um, not character, but species trope that they're, they're small and... <laughs> We're voles. Oh, we small. Any bees could confuse us for one. That's adorable. I like that. Um, it's a really nice, straightforward app. We get his backstory. So, um, we don't know how he winds up in the crater, but perhaps he gets caught. Perhaps that's and where he ends up running into by accident. We're not sure. So, very nice, clever character. He's he's cheeky. I love a cheeky character. I do. He's cheeky though, without being dickish. You know, like okay. He's he started a bar fight. He he might be a bit of a thief as well, but he hasn't actually really hurt anyone in the application. He's just kind of showed these otters up, and they're supposed to be guards, and they just totally let this drunk meandering mole get away. So it's a cute character application. Um, I don't know if I'm convinced though. Um, I'm not really. It's, it's nothing special that makes me want to know more about this character. He's kind of laid it all on the line here. Um, but, you know, it's a good character. It uh, it reads really well. Um, the scene is set. Um, he really likes the look on other beasts' faces. So he probably he revels in his um, ability to just confound with blithering verbal diarrhea. <laughs> So yeah, he definitely he's a Gabby beast. He he fits this category really well. Um, I I I don't know who I'm gonna vote for in this category. This is actually a really tough one. These three characters are all very different in their in the way they wield their gift of gab. So um, good work, Sly. Good work. You're in the top thirty. That's that's more than some people can say. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna move on though. I don't really have too much to say about Sly. It's it didn't unimpress me, but it also didn't blow me away as far as an application goes. Next on the list of Beasts with the Gift of Gab, we have Huber Blackfoot. He's a 30 seasons old vole. Uh, the way I read seasons in Redwall is the equivalent of a human year. So if I see 30 seasons, I automatically assume 30 years. I know some beasts have put years in their application. Some people have put seasons. I just, it's all translatable to me. I don't like, 30 seasons doesn't mean 15 years to me or something like that. Um... Anyway, so here we go, Huber. I love the name Huber Blackfoot. I don't know why. It, it just, I don't know, Huber. <laughs> I like it, Huber. It's appropriately Red Wallian while still being original, so. Okay, here we go, Huber. Huber tripped along the path as he whistled to himself. He paused every now and then to spit out the dust that he stirred. A hump in the path caused him to stumble, and he staggered a little, trying to keep upright. His pack clanked on his back and he smiled, pleased at his earlier trade. Who knew that blacksmith badgers could make decorative hangings and candle holders? He had thought they kept to heroes' swords and berserkers' armor. The crab horde snapped their claws, their eye stalks all a swivel. I booked their king right in the eye and shocked them with my drivel. He tottered to a stop, 
catching his breath and trying to ensure he would not topple over. He chuckled. Drivel. It wouldn't me mum be glad to know I'm still spouting it. Not. <laughs> Is that so? Came a voice from behind him. Embarrassed at possible witnesses to his clumsiness, he turned, his overfull pack threatening his balance still. He faced several beasts who blocked the path behind him, and he was disconcerted to note that most were vermin, though one scarred hair smirked mockingly at him. Hoover pasted a silly grin on his face, keeping his paws behind his back, sliding one towards the knife hidden there. Oh, I twas the bane of her existence, so she told me. Hubert, she'd bell her, quit your yapping and get the pears picked, or you'll feel the back of me paw. He chuckled forcefully, straining. Like as not, I'd feel the back of her paw, spoon, foot, paw, me tail, or apron. His grin widened. I weren't one to keep, mum, if and you catch my meaning. Oh, I, a rat snarled, and Hubert recognized the initial speaker. Hooper's pack clanked, and he flinched, cursing the fit that had caused him to trade perfectly good cloth for metal decorations. "'You know, what have we got?' a bass growl sounded, and a heavy paw clamped the back of Hooper's neck. A second paw twisted his, wrenching it from under the pack, and the knife he had finally clasped thumped to the path. "'Now that just ain't friendly,' sneered the deep voice, and the otter shook Hooper loose from his pack and dropped him to the path. Hooper tried for a wheezing laugh. Oh, of course you see. I am a merchant, gotta protect myself from robbers. He trailed off as he finally noticed the matching blue uniform worn by all, and swallowed hard. These were no mere brigands. We've got, the rat paused, a proposition. The rest chuckled. There's opportunity for more money than a merchant, such as yourself, could make, and entertainment a plenty to boot. Hoover rose, trying to dust himself off. Oh, well, then, if it's entertainment you want, I'm sure I could turn a tail or two for you. Raucous laughter rang out. Oh, aye, you'll turn all right. Only it won't be tails you'll be barring, sneered the otter. Hoover's avenue of escape shrank before his eyes. Well, he tried once more, much as the sound of this opportunity is tempting, I'm a merchant, you see. A shove in the back sent him sprawling, and he was yanked to his footpaws amidst jeers. The spear that had knocked him down now hovered before his snout, and he knew he would be given no choice. The blue-bedecked crew fell in around him as the rat lifted the spear. In a tramping march, they ushered him along the path, and Huber fumbled along, trying to hide his panic. So, Hubert. Some beast beside him muttered. Huber quickly glanced over to see the hare, who was also surreptitiously glancing around. What happened with the crab horde? Looking young for the first time, he flicked his eyes to Huber's in a way. Oh, I'm called Huber. Me mum named me Hubert. Huber squashed the memory of the young hedgehog who had renamed him seasons back. Well, the ratty beasts were so confused by my blabbing, them having no talk of their own, you see, and they started dancing around one another. I took a rope tied to a crab leg and just let them tangle themselves up. It were the easiest thing to find their trove of pearls after and stow the gab, snapped the otter, glaring at them both. Both Hoover and the hare started, and the hare straightened, ears slicking against his head. Hoover had caught a gleam of curiosity in the young thing's eyes, however. He smiled inwardly. Perhaps all was not lost, after all. So there you go, we have Hoover. Um... I didn't really like that last sentence that I ended on. Perhaps all was not lost after all. You've used all twice there. And to me, that's just a little redundant. It could have been written better. But, you know, perhaps you're just scrambling to find a way to, to conclude this application to, you know, let everyone know that, well, maybe this young this young hair might be a little, uh, I don't want to say maybe manipulatable, but maybe Hoover can persuade him to be on his side and throw him a hand. Also, there's some inconsistency in this application. Um, when Hooper originally sees the, the, the band that's accosting him, he notes that there's only, like, one scarred hair. But there's also um, an otter, like, right off the bat with a big bass voice and uh, heavy paws. And he's kind of an assaulting jerk, actually. He twists Hooper's hand until he drops his knife. Um, I think Hooper... <clears throat> is a legitimate merchant, unlike uh, Sly Speakeasy, who were had traded with the um, 
with the badger's cloth for metal decoration. So, you know, he's, he's a good beast, but, and he, he has a, a gab, and he gets up to some mischief. You know, there's this crab horde that snaps their claws. I like the little ditty, by the way. The crab horde snap their claws, their eye stalks hold a swivel. I bop their king right in the eye and shock them with my drivel. That's a song you can drink to, so I like that. <laughs> um, There's some notion that you know he, he he's he's a legitimate merchant like i'm saying he carries his knife and he only brings it out when he he thinks he's about to get robbed um why this teeny tiny vole travels alone rather than with someone else um i don't know there's no way a vole could take on a group of beasts like the one the rat the otter and the hare are all in um they're blue uniforms i don't know are they you guard are they like early you guard or is this just like a gang uniform or like their their horde outfit maybe they actually have the budget for a uniform i'm not sure so there's a few unanswered questions here um not sure if these these brigands are taking hoover like they're press ganging him into the crater with uh, actual authority or if they're just selling him into bondage in the crater um, I am a little more interested in Hoover than I was Sly. Like, I am curious, like, a little bit, like, how did he get into this crab horde where he had to, like, catch crab legs and tie them together? That, that's kind of an interesting story, and I wonder, you know, he's probably got more of those. So he, he uses his gift of gab, I think, more realistically than Sly, but at the same time, he's not as effective as Sly was. His talking and talking yeah it helped with the crabs because they don't actually have their language of their own they're probably not even um you know mentally intelligible creatures they're um so um yeah but but yeah Huber he 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 does however kind of get his his gift of gab gives him a chance like with this this young hair who's asking him about the crabs in the end and so um maybe this gift of gab will come in handy or you know if if Hoover you get into the crater you're gonna really have to step it up with the with the talking and the actual gift of Hoover's gab because in this particular application it didn't actually do him any good we just know that he he can talk and he always seems to have something to say but then again he also he doesn't say too much you know he keeps insisting that he's a merchant and you know, um, uh, please don't press gang me. I'm a merchant, you see. I'm a merchant, I'm a merchant, I'm a merchant. But it doesn't work. So his, his gab really isn't a gift in the application. I'm not, I'm not seeing it. I've seen potential at the end for a, for a story that could, could do well in the crater. Um, <clears throat> so uh, congratulations, Uber, on getting into the top 30. I'm going to move on a little bit. Uh, we have up next, we have Bechtel. Is it Bechtel or Bechtel? I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to say Bechtel because that rolls off the tongue a little easier for the sake of reading this. Uh, he's a Vesper bat, and so he's our second bat in the competition. Um... Callie was the other bat from the Silly Beast competition. Uh, she wasn't a Vesper bat, though. She's a fox bat. Um, I don't... I can't say I know what a Vesper bat is. I know what a fox bat is. I know they're... Um, I know fox bats are enormous for bats. They're, like, they're actually really, really big. Um, I mean, they're called flying foxes, right? Not just because their ears and their orange fur, but they're just... They're ginormous... Um, Vesper bats, I don't, I don't know if that's the same thing as the evening bat. Um, or the evening bat, we also call them common bats. Um, and I'm actually just going to take a minute to, to Wikipedia Vesper bat. Okay. Um, Vesper bats, also known as evening bats or common bats, are the largest and best known family of bats. I think I read this page for, for an assignment in school, which is why I knew evening bats and common bats are the same thing. Uh, Vesper bats belong to the suborder 
Microcharoptera, um, over 300 species, are distributed all over the world on every continent except Antarctica. It owes its name to the Latin word vespertilio, bat, from vesper, meaning evening. Okay, whatever. Uh, so they're microbats. They're really small, I'm assuming. So it'd be interesting to see the vesper bat standing next to the fox bat. Just, you know, I think maybe um, they could build a kind of character bond based on that they're bats they're both flying beasts in a gladiator competition but the size difference might also like make them either resent or be wary of each other anyways uh so here we go we have bestel i personally guarantee it one sniff and your sniffles will sniff their last breath to prove it bestel held the sap soaked stick up to his nostrils and inhaled deeply the fragrance of pine, the richness of cured honey, and the buzzing of something growing very la Bestel dropped the stick and doubled over, snorting violently and smacking at the vandal pillaging the soft innards of his nostrils. After a second that lasted far too long, the foe absconded back into the sky, issuing forth a mocking buzz. Away with you, foul winged demon! Bestel shouted at the fly. Watching the stupid little creature meander its way deeper into the village to torment some other poor soul. Bestel paid no mind to the stares of the surrounded woodlanders as he tucked his winged arms to his side, bent down, and squinted at the blurry floor. Now, now, where did you go? Past the blur that still clouded his eyes, Bestel saw the thousands of cobblestone pebbles, the watermelon seeds a flutter's distance away trailing deeper into town, the inchworms whose movement echoed just beneath the topsoil. The Bestel frowned, reached into the fog, and plucked the incense stick up, and looked at the half that dangled by a fiber. The boss won't like this, he muttered, tossing it onto a pile of other broken mishaps. <laughs> you still trying to pull off your idiot beaster burbles? Bestel's frown deepened. He rotated his head 90 degrees to rest his narrowed eyes upon the approaching blur of velvety-furred malevolence. Gurry, he growled, frowning yet deeper as the mole's particularly poorly bred features came to his mind. Everywhere Gurry went, trouble followed, and a mile long of false promises and broken trinkets. What be my name? Gurry said with a proud swagger of his blubber's girth and a tug of his breakfast covered snout. I'll have you know, the boss is a brilliant inventor, Bestel said with a swing of an incense stick. And also that this is also my spot to sell, so... Bestel fluttered the tips of his wings at Gurry. The mole squinted. Bestel fluttered his wingtips again, accentuating the dip-and-shove motion. The mole blinked. So go away! Gurry, instead of responding in any sensible fashion, set his box of goods down and began to remove them. What are you doing? Bestel screamed, horror increasing upon seeing just how many bottles and vials and things the mole brought along. You're my loud, annoying little mousy bird boy, Gurry rumbled as he continued to set out his wares. No, I won't stand for this. You're a fiend of dubious character, diabolical ways, and devilishly dry pastries. Gurry turned to face the crowd. Come on, come on. Expertrants to healing properties of Gurry's ginner wide out of all. Betchel snatched two of the sticks and held them up. If you would like to slather snake spit over your fur, then I agree. But for more decent beasts, only these will cure those summer sniffles. Sniffing for flowers when I drop a little fix your spine, fingers, and foggy eyesight. Well, these can cure everyday aches and pains. Otter oil can even cure dry ditch fever. Betchel's jaw hung loose. Before he could sputter out a reply, a small, strained voice spoke up. Is that true? Betchel saw the blurry form of a mouse maid standing near Gurry. Sure it is. It's a few drops down the hatch. Liar, Betchel whispered, loud enough to see. The damp handkerchief clutched in the mouse maid's quivering paw, the puffiness in her eyes, the tenuous hope as she reached to pay for the bottle. Liar! Bestial screamed, tackling Gurry to the ground. 
The two beasts tumbled for several feet before coming to a stop, Meshel pinning the mole down. How dare you! How could you! he snapped, shoving the mole against the ground several times. Not this time! I won't stand by and let you hurt someone this time! For the first time, he noticed how hard Gurry shook in his grip, how l- tightly he grasped the mole, and how much blood streamed out onto the cobblestone. Beshel stumbled back onto his feet. I... I didn't... He saw all the stairs directed his way, and his gaze stopped when he looked at the mouse maid. Her features blurred as the echoes diminished around him, but he saw her expression clearly. The horror, the fear, the hatred. Things he had seen before. Beshel launched himself outward, flying into the blurred, featureless, unwatching sky. So there's... Beshtel. And once again, Beshtel, I really hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, sorry if I'm not. Sorry. Sorry. So Beshtel, obviously, he's, you know, he, he, he thinks, he likes his job. We'll say that. He likes his job. He believes in the products that he's sniffing. You know, he actually, like, takes a, a huff off the uh, pine-cured honey and bee incense stick. Um, he, he's very much against this other merchant Guri selling <laughs> literally snake oil <laughs> to people and claiming that it um, cures dry ditch fever, which is something that's really bad in, in Redwall. It's, it's probably equivalent of scarlet fever, I guess, in our real life world here on the other side. Um, um, yeah, he, um, Beshel, he leans on this, uh, once again, another species trope, um, kind of like sly speakies he did with the whole revolt, sir, we're teeny tiny, obviously you'd stick two for, for one. Well, Beshel's a bat and he has echolocation, but instead of screaming and screeching like, uh, like Holly does in her singing, in the silly beast category, Beshel just talks and the sound bounces around everything and that's how he gets his, uh, his imagery. I don't know if, how that's going to work in the crater. Probably you could just ignore it, that whole shtick, because it, the crater's very popular. Beasts are going to be screaming all the time. There's going to be sound going everywhere. He probably won't even have to worry about it. Like, you could gag this bat, and he'd probably still see even better than anyone else. Like, he sees inchworms underneath the topsoil he sees a trail of watermelon seeds amongst thousands of cobblestones so his sight's pretty good if he gets it going um this is a really interesting character i don't i'm not sure what happens at the end there does he does he maim gurry and his anger or does he accidentally kill gurry because it says here the horror the fear the hatred you know if someone assaulted somebody because he was like no you're you're being a, a, a conniving jerk i'm not gonna let you swindle this poor mouse maid but then the mouse maid uh, she's looking at him with hatred and horror and fear so that to me makes makes me see it makes me think that Beshel accidentally killed gurry and he's shaking in in gurry's grip possibly because he's gone into shock or he's in agonizing pain or maybe he's just horrified because he sees death coming for him not sure um so yeah i didn't have any problem Trouble picking up on the echolocation shtick. Um, it's just, it's true to the species, so it's not gimmicky. I'm not going to say it's gimmicky. I just think that yeah, once you're in the arena, it's not going to be relevant. Like the other bat didn't mention anything about echolocation. I'm not sure fox bats actually echolocate. Do all bats echolocate? Further research must be done. But um, yeah, through the echolocation, there's a lot of details. Like um. The, the 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 watermelon seeds, the inchworms, um, just the, the expressions on people's faces, how they look at him. Um, so it's it's an interesting application. Definitely using what you got, and if you have a bat, then you got echolocation. Good old mole speak in there. Um, uh, Gurry's no Strathcombe Piccadilly, but the mole speak is pretty consistent, at least, right? It sounds like mole, and really, when you're speaking with a phonetic accent like mole speak, who cares? <laughs> There's no real grammar rules. What are those? Um, yeah, so, um, that's just pretty good. Um, I like this application. It's well-rounded. I don't really think... Oh, that's something I wanted to mention about Huber, too. The whole hedgehog changing his name. This whole thing with uh, Vegetal having this little spat with the 
be kind of, it does really nothing except set Beshel up as kind of a a silly, silly fool almost. Like he get these inhales and I don't know, maybe it's because he didn't see the bee that he huffs it up, but like when when your sight is based on sound, that buzzing should have probably given away that there was a bee there. So uh, I don't think the whole thing was necessary. It could have you could have used that space more for for characterization rather than just making Bestial look cute and setting up a cute scene. Um, but he's still an interesting character. Like I I just I want to know if he killed Guri or if he just maimed Guri at the end there because that that honestly does it bothers me that I don't know. It bothers me that I can't tell. It's not obvious enough, and it really should be. Like, is Bestial fleeing because he just a- committed assault, or did he commit murder, you know? Like, this could all play very heavily into how he gets into the crater. Anyway, so, um, yeah, once again, um, Bestial, he's not a blabbermouth. Like, um, he's not a blithering fool, like Sly. He's not a blabbermouth like Huber. But he, he... Is his gift of gab is echolocation? I thought that was really interesting. 